Hello, my friends. Welcome to Prime Strings. I'm Henriette, and today's live stream is called Ask Me Anything Violin Related. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. This session is suitable for beginners and for advanced players, for young people and for people who are not so young. Um, so welcome, everyone. And um, it's lovely to see you here today. Since this is a question and answer session, I do encourage you to take an active part in the conversation. I don't know how long this conversation will be. I envisage uh, we may go on until 11 o'clock, but depending on how many questions you have, we may um, stop it a little bit earlier. We'll see how it goes. Um, so it depends very much on the audience how this will pan out to be a live class. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about how we can communicate with one another. Uh, on the right hand side of your screen, you will see a text box and you can text your messages in there and then hit the send button and then I can read your question. There are a couple of other features that go with this text box. So if you have a look at the bottom of your screen, first of all, you see that little emoji sign. You can use that to send emojis. And then you can have a look at that little dollar sign button. If you click on that, you can do that now. It's, it, it's not going to affect anything that you do, but you get the option of sending a super chat or a super sticker. And this is a paid feature on this channel. So if you want to pin your question to the top of the chat box, you can choose Super Chat. And depending on the value of your pur purchase, it will stay up there for longer or shorter. And the Super Sticker option is for you to convey emotions about how you feel about this live class. Um, I would be using the revenue of the paid features uh, to make more videos in my channel. Um, and I will also send um, um, I will also send a Pram Strings music notebook to the top three purchasers. So this is a music notebook that you can use for lesson notes. It's got line, lined pages on the inside. Uh, but uh, for that, I will um, I will check all the chats after this class. And if you um, if you enable notifications, I can respond to you and you can get a message on your in your email inbox. Now, if you're a young person and you're here, remember that you may only take part in the paid um, options when you have permission from your parent or from your supervisor. So let's go ahead and let's get started with a little bit of chat practice. Can you please write down where you live and how long you've been playing for. And this is just for me, out of interest, to see who we have here. Um, I may know you, I may not know you. Everyone's welcome and it's just lovely to see you here. But why don't you write um, where you live and how long you've been playing for? Take your time. Uh, because you have to find out how everything works. So I'm totally appreciative of that. So the question is, can you write down where you live and um, how long you've been playing for? That's lovely. Thank you so much. There are a whole lot of uh, people that are answering and writing in there and um, you're all over the UK, from what I can see. Welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see you here. So there is also already one question that's come in. And I will answer that question first. So we can now get started. And if you have any questions, do please write them down. And the first question is very much a very, a very useful question. And that question is, how often would you recommend to rosin your bow? And that depends on how much you play, really. I rosin my bow roughly once a day, but then I put quite a lot of rosin in, uh, quite a lot of rosin on. And then um, as I feel my bow gets a li little bit slippery, I will put more rosin on in the day. But then I play almost all of the day, every day. So I usually say to people, put a little bit of rosin on, uh, every day and then you'll be all right. 
However, if you, I'm just getting my violin, if you can see a whole lot of snow here on the place where you bow, it means that you have been rosining a little bit too much. So you can see if it's completely clear, it may mean that your bow is a little bit slippery and you can you can rosin a little bit less. However, if you are finding that you're losing a lot of rosin because it gives a lot of dust on your violin, then um, you can perhaps rosin a little bit less. Now, if that happens, and I can see it a little, uh, I can see it quite a lot that there's a lot of rosin on here, um, you need to wipe it off with a soft duster because the rosin and the varnish of your violin have a chemical reaction together. So you don't want the, to leave the rosin down there because it will, as it were, melt away the varnish of your violin and then you've got a real problem that you can have to sort out after, after you leave it on for a couple of years or so. So I would imagine that if you just, after playing, just um, dust your violin, you'll be fine. Now, let me see. Let me see. Oh my gosh, people are here from England, from Egypt, from Norwich, from Cambridge, from Newcastle, from Birmingham. <laughs> it's lovely to see everyone here. And um, there is another question, and that is a good one too. Um, what shoulder rest would you recommend? Actually, I'll come to that in a second because just another question has come in. What type of rosin do you recommend? And that is also a very useful question because there are so many types of rosin on the market. Now, if you're generally a little bit um, prone to cuffs and colds and you have allergic reactions uh, really easily, there is a type of anti-allergy anti rosin, which some of my pupils use. And that, is, that seems to work really, really well. Now, then there is slightly stickier rosin and slightly harder rosin that comes off more difficult when you rosin your bow. Uh, and that is a, totally a matter of personal preference. And it is, it is sometimes difficult to find out because you don't wear out a piece of rosin very easily, you see. So uh, it's a matter of trial and error. If you start with... A rosin that sort of mid range, um, then you can't go very far wrong. It is it is soft enough for you to only have to rosin uh, uh, for a limited period of time before the rosin comes off. If you get to the very cheap rosin, you have to rosin quite a lot before it actually comes off into your bow. Um, if you get the top end rosin, uh, then it comes off just like that and you have very little rosining to do before you have it. Now, it depends a little bit as well um, on where you live because some rosins are more suitable to higher temperatures and others more for colder temperatures. So uh, it's a matter of trial and error. I have, um, I have used um, Perastra Gold for as long as I can remember and I absolutely love it because it's very easy to rosin but I should emphasize that I'm not sponsored by Perastro and other brands are available but if you are looking to start off on finding your uh, perfect rosin then start on a mid-range one and um, then go up uh, in value for a little bit just to try how that differs and and, and lower as well if you find it too expensive. I think rosin, if you pay a tenner for a piece of rosin, which is m very much near the top end of what you can pay for a piece of rosin, it lasts for years and years, unless you drop it, uh, then uh, that might smash the pieces. I hope that answers your question. So another question is, what shoulder rest would I recommend? Um, uh, that's a good question and I can answer it because I have in recent weeks been looking for different shoulder rests uh, and I have come back again to my good old Wolf Forte Secondo. I've tried the very, very expensive ones and they have as an, ex uh, as an, uh, as an advantage that they are very light um, and very, very um, manageable in that you can you can manipulate them to the shape of your shoulder so you can bend them. Um, but I still find after all these years that the, the, the wolf one is I can bend it to 
the shape of my shoulder. I don't know. I haven't bent this one yet, but I could bend it like that. Could you see that? And that fits just on my collarbone. Hey, Dutch girl, that is a very, very nice gesture. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll come to your question later on. Um, so I've, I've, I've bent my shoulder rest slightly so it stays better on my collarbone. Now, you can get shoulder rests that go over the shoulder, um, like the Bon Musica, I think it's called. They have a little hook. And I used to play that when I was at um, music college. So I did like that a lot then because I got my shoulder got tired really quite a lot for playing a lot. Um, but at the moment, I have this one. Um, I would like you to, it just depends as well on how long you've been playing. But if you have been playing for only a short while, find something that's not too rigid. So something that is a little bit flexible and bouncy, you can see that I can dent it a little bit, you see? Uh, because whatever you do when you're a beginner, you don't want to get into that rigid position because it's going to um, affect your your playing style, the relaxation in your playing as well. Um, so again, <laughs> although I use the wolf shoulder rest, there are many different shoulder rests available. Um, and I would go for something that is as flexible as possible. I tend to, this is another little point that I want to make, the cool ones, I stay well clear of them and I don't need to touch them. Because I'm used to bending the shoulder rest, I have broken quite a few cool ones because they are not flexible. So be careful if you want to do that. Uh, you can't do it with the cool one. Now, let me just read for a moment what other questions we have. Um, how can I make my violin sound less screechy? That is a very, very good point. Uh, lots of people will um, hopefully recognize what you can do, uh, uh, how that happens. Uh, your violin sounding screechy can have different um, reasons. One is you can have too much or too little rosin. Um, so that you can check that out if you've got that patch of white stuff here then you might try using less rosin and cleaning your strings now when you clean your strings and that is another aspect that might be a different reason for why your um, violin might sound screechy um, is clean your strings with alcohol catenatis, which is 70% cleaning alcohol. That is very harsh stuff and it's good for your strings, but it does chip away on your rosin as well. So if you do that, I would recommend just putting a little cloth underneath here so you make sure that if you use alcohol on your violin, uh, you're not splashing it onto the um, varnish of your violin. So that might be one reason why your um, violin sounds screechy. The other reason um, is, the most likely reason, is that your bow is um, at an angle. Let me just get my bow and I can show you. So if your bow is like this, uh, your violin sounds more screechy because this is not the optimum way to make your strings vibrate. So if you are like that, what I'm doing, I'll show you, um, if you can see my hand, if this is my issue, what I'm doing is I'm bringing my hand forward. Can you see? So my hand now, if you look straight ahead of me, my hand is straight in front of my tummy. Can you see that? Whereas before it was much more to the side like that. So that is another reason why your violin might be screechy is that your bow is not straight. So um, there may be other reasons as well why your violin sound screechy it may be that you're playing too much on the side of your bow and for beginners I would recommend trying to stay upright with the stick immediately above the hair uh, and it's only when you're more advanced and you're creating more difference different tone colors and so on that your bow might go on its side edge of the hair you see so different ways why your violin might sound screechy different reasons and this is how you can cure them there is one more other thing and that is more for if you're an advanced player um 
there is a relationship between the speed of the bow and the weight of the bow into the strings. So your violin might be screechy if the weight is too heavy in comparison to the speed. So if my bow travels very, very slowly, I need to be lighter than when my bow travels really, really fast. You can, pr you can press a lot harder on the bow if you move it. Okay, so if it's screechy, some, something in that balance isn't quite right. Either your speed is too slow or your weight is too heavy or maybe a bit of both. So you might try to um, change either or the other and see if that happens. Now, let me just read some more comments. Um, what do I think of carbon fiber bows? That is a very useful question. Golly, you're all on the ball, aren't you? <laughs> Thank you for this question. That's a good one. Um, they are good bows in themselves, um, and they are not too stiff and not too flexible either. What you sometimes see is that bows are very, very bendy. Uh, and the carbon fiber bows, I would definitely recommend for younger children that drop, they're more prone to dropping their bows because they break much less uh, quickly. So uh, I would go, if you're a more advanced player, I would go to the proper Pernambuco bows uh, because you get more feel in your hand for the bow. But if you're a beginner, you don't feel that anyway. So you do that, you learn to feel it once you're further advanced and you can play with a more relaxed bow hand. So then it really starts to matter if you work on tone colors and so on. Um, then it really starts to matter um, how, how flexible or how feely your bow is. And then I wouldn't really, um, go for a carbon fiber bow. Sorry, I was slightly distracted there because Tommy has just put another um, uh, super chat on. So thank you very much, Tommy. Lovely to hear from you. Um, I'll come to your question later on. Just hang on a moment. So that is what I think of carbon fiber bows. All right for beginners, very good for young children because they break a little bit less quickly. Um, not very suitable for advanced players. Ah, now then, let me just answer Michael's question. Thank you, Michael, for your question. Um, how do you do vibrato with your pinky? Now, that is that is a very topical question because in our um, virtual violin practice play along videos, the, the series that I'm currently um, recording there there is a section that's that's just started dealing with vibrato and vibrato on a pinky um, ha, you can do in different ways so if you follow my course you want to see that you roll your pinky and that is one way you can see the knuckles in my pinky they bend and stretch now the pinky is a weird finger because unlike the other fingers your pinky rolls I don't know if you can see that your pinky, can you see the mark on my finger? Your pinky rolls more across your finger. Hang on, sorry. More across your fingertip than lengthwise, which the other fingers do. So that is a big difference in your pinky vibrato. Now, there are some violins. So I teach it like this in the same way, but rolling sideways rather than forwards and backwards. Um, there are other schools of violin playing that say your pinky can be flat and then you can do it like that, you see? But that is a much more stiff way of playing vibrato and that is suitable for some really quick pieces and pieces that are uh, more tense in nature anyway. Um, so if you, it depends on very much, in other words, what kind of style of music you're playing. If your if your piece is very soft and gentle, that sort of vibrato doesn't really go with the style of the piece. You see, so either you place your finger a lot a lot flatter, and then you still move from your from your elbow onwards. I I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? But it's not rolling. Some pinkies find that rolling really painful or not comfortable at all, and other pinkies can roll when they play vibrato. I hope that answers your question. 
there is another question, and that is also a very useful one. Thank you. Uh, what can I do to fix shaking the bow? And that is something that many people can um, relate to, I think. So that's a very, very good question to, ans to ask. Thank you. Shaking of the bow has usually something to do with tension in your upper arm. So the thing to do, and that doesn't happen overnight, the thing to do is try to release that tension in your upper arm. So what you might do is play an open string. Then if you can feel the shaking coming along, it usually happens sort of upper half, doesn't it? Stop the bow and drop your shoulder down and relax your upper arm. Okay, and then after a while, you get used to that being primed to relax more. That should get better over time. Once you have got used to playing with more tension in perhaps your right shoulder or your right upper arm, uh, that becomes a habit really quickly. And sadly, <laughs> it happens to most people, and it, I'm sure it happened to me as well when I first started learning. When you learn a new skill, you tend to do that with far too much pressure. If you've learned to, to do ballet or ice skating or whatever you might think, if when you first have your first driving lesson, don't you sit behind the steering wheel like that? And later when you've passed your test and you've been driven for a, and you've been driving for a couple of years, you can actually relax while driving, you see. And it's the same when you play the violin. The more you practice and the more you learn to relax it, that will go. But as I said, it can be quite persistent. Uh, but do this exercise to on the open string, stop about in the middle, drop all of this down. Feel that relaxed state of your arm and then continue. And if you have specific pieces where you always, always shake on certain notes, just practice it like that. So you hold it in the middle, drop it all down, and hopefully that will help. Now let me just see if there are any more questions there. I'm just scrolling through my... Um, Text box just to see rosening your bow, rosening your bow. I have asthma. Okay, someone has asked a question about which rosin do you use? Can you remember? And this person says, um, the rosin that I use is particularly dusty. So uh, go and try and find an, a non-allergenic rosin and hopefully you'll notice the difference. I've cer certainly had some pupils in the past that have really benefited from not sneezing anymore <laughs> during their lessons. So hopefully that will help you. Um, There is another question. Let me. Ah, okay. Somebody else asked this question. That is also a very, very uh, good question. I am having issues with strings going out of tune. Um, that is, especially in winter or or in summer. That's a bit strange. On an answer. When the temperatures change many strings do go out of tune because the violin is a natural product. It shrinks and it uh, expands depending on the atmospheric pressure. Now, if it gets very cold, like it was here in the UK last week, um, I had three, ping, three strings ping on me one day and it gets extremely frustrating. But it is because it gets colder, the air pressure goes down and the pegs shrink. And if they shrink in their peg holes, because they're shaped to <laughs> to hold like that as well, but it also means that if they shrink, they go. Um, so what you can do is squeeze them into the peg box more, uh, because a peg is has this conical shape that if you push it in further, it will hold better. But um, when the atmospheric pressure changes quite a lot, or when it gets suddenly very hot, uh, it might get harder to move your pegs. So I'm afraid because the violin is a natural product, 
you can't do too much about it other than frequently tuning your violin. That makes it more likely, more likely, I say, uh, that it will stay in tune. Um, that's about all I can say about it. It has nothing to do with the quality of your strings. It has certainly something to do with the quality of your pegs. Actually, I could add to that this thing. If you have a look at your peg box here, the peg that comes from this end sticks out here a little bit, doesn't it? Now, I don't know if you can see this, but it sticks out only a little bit. Can you see that? Just here. Now, some pegs have worn so much that they have gone through the peg box for a lot further. So sometimes I see pegs that stick out like that. And that is because of wear and tear. If you keep turning them the whole time, they do uh, wear down a little bit, don't they? Um, so you might have, if this is a persistent problem and you can't fix it by pushing your uh, peg into the peg holes, you might then make a once they're open again and see if they can uh, fitting peg. Okay, but um, of um, string, it's it's to do with atmospheric pressure most of all. Let me see. Someone says if ah uh, uh, okay. Also, you know, you 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 people, you're asking all these very relevant relevant questions. This is a question that says, I have recently started clipping my fingernails much more, and I always say to people, this is how you can spot a violin player on the train is their left hand fingers are ultra short and their right hand fingers are like normal. Uh, yes, violinists have very, very short nails on their left hand so that you can push the strings down with the padded part of your finger. Okay, so if you feel your nail on the string, that is a really horrible feeling. And it also affects the sound because it gets, when you put your finger down, it's the holidays here now, so I've got slightly longer fingers. But maybe you can hear. I don't know how well that comes across, but you can probably hear a more sharper sound compared with when I touch the strings just with the padded part of my fingers. So yes, clip them, clip them shorter. And some people have nails that are attached to your fingertip um, much further to the top of your finger. Uh, if you keep clipping them or filing them down a little bit more, you will end up with a little bit of pad. Like, can you see it here? Can you see that the pad of my finger is slightly further forward than my nail? Can you see that? And that's just grown like that over time because I always have very short fingernails. So I hope that helps and answers your question. Um, Ah, somebody else also says um, my D string has been slipping really badly. Yes, um, this past week has been ultra, old, <laughs> ultra frustrating for strings going down. So uh, if that happened to you, it, it might well have been the weather. Oh, and somebody else says, and that is a very good point as well. I left my violin near a radiator and the pegs slipped three of the pegs slipped. So yes, that is also not a good thing, isn't it? I tend to say if you are in a comfortable temperature yourself, then it's probably good for your violin to be in as well. So if you are leaving your violin in a car when it's frosty outside, that's not helpful. Or when it's in a car and it's really sunny and very, very hot, that's not good. And similarly, if you were to sit next to your radiator, um, that would get uncomfortably hot after a while, wouldn't it? So uh, that is not good for your violin either. Now, especially in this time of year when um, the temperatures from inside and outside are very, very different, um, do wrap your violin into a, a scarf or into a tea towel when you go out. I know most orchestras are not on this time or children don't take their violins to school quite so much. So um, it's perhaps slightly less applicable. Once you start going out again, and I hope that won't be too long, once you start going out again and the temperature indoors is very different from, it, from the temperature outdoors, wrap your violin into some sort of cloth. 
just like you put your coat on when you go outside. I hope that answers your question. Are there any more questions or are there ones that I have forgotten to answer? Now, there is one more question that somebody asked me, and I think that's quite an interesting question as well. So we'll go on, um, I'll go on and answer, answering that one uh, whilst you think of some more questions, if you have any. Um, someone says, um, how, what's it like being at music college? Uh, this person I happen to know, and um, he's thinking about going to music college. And what young people always think is that music college is like Fame Academy. And, oh, thank you, Michael, for um, your donation. Thank you very much. Please ask, please ask your question again. I'll come back to my music college answer. How do you play the slide less screechy? Okay, okay, good question. I'll get your question. I'll come to that. So lots of people, um, Tommy asked about bow maintenance. Oh, good one. Sorry, apologies that I've forgotten that. Let me answer these questions. Then it's Michael and then it's Tommy. Thank you for reminding me. Do that again if I forget. <laughs> Um, what's it like being a music college? Uh, parts of it are like Fame Academy, of course, that you put on huge productions together with your fellow music students. Uh, but a large part of music college is you sitting in your room, practicing your violin like mad uh, for days on end. And then you might have a technique class or a concerto class or something to go to. So it's not all... Um, as people sometimes think that it's all wonderful. Yes, it is wonderful. Uh, but you have to take into account that A, competition is fierce, and B, it's a lot of hard work on your own. So um, it's lovely. If this is what you want to do, then by all means, apply to music college. Um, and I would definitely recommend it. It served me well all that time. And uh, But you have to realise that it's not like some people think it is. I hope that is a fair answer. Um, let me know if you want to know more. So how do you play the, the slide less screechy? That is also a very useful question. And I assume that with the slide, you imagine when you change positions. And I think that's what you've got in mind, isn't it? So um, the slide is, a, is a, good, uh, a good one to consider because we said um, when your bow is screechy, uh, it depends on the weight of the bow into the string compared with its speed. But now you're going to play your finger, if it slides, is a little bit lighter on the string, isn't it? So um, as a result, your bow has to be a little bit lighter as well because you're pressing lighter on the string with your left hand. So that, if if we go back to our earlier conversation about... Um, the weight versus the speed of the bow, if your bow press is lighter, it should really go a little bit more slowly as well. And especially when you're practicing sliding from one position to another, um, you might do that very slowly. You do it slowly for the left hand, but then it could be good exercise to for the bow as well. And let me see if I can show you where have I left my bow. Here we are. So let me slide from here, B on the A string. Let's do this as an example. Now, when I'm lightening my finger, my bow should be fairly light. And now I'm going to deliberately make a mistake and leave the weight of my bow the same. Can you hear that? And it sounds like it's almost choking. You can't let the sound come out. And that is because your bow goes a little bit more slowly, but your finger is also lighter. So you want to be lighter on both ends, both the left hand and the right hand. If I go too light on the other hand, 
can hear the difference, then suddenly I don't make a sound anymore. So you've got to find that balance, and that is only the player that can judge exactly how the weight and the speed and the lightness of the finger uh, compares well with one another, because that is slightly different for each and every bow and instrument, you see. So you can play around with a little bit, and that's a good way of practicing, is put more pressure on deliberately. Deliberately make it more screechy, and then deliberately try to lighten both your left hand and the bow. I'm hoping that has answered your question. Now, let me go and answer Tommy's question now about um, bow maintenance. Yes, apologies, Tommy, that I have forgotten your question. Bow maintenance is really quite easy. All you do, especially if you've used quite a lot of rosin, is get your cloth. So there should always be like a soft cloth in your violin case, really. And just wipe the stick. And that is for the same reason as your... Um, as you wipe your violin because you want to take the rosin off that varnish you see now if there is a lot of a lot of rosin on the stick um because you didn't know about this maybe or it's just accumulated over time you can use varnish cleaner and that is a, a product that you can buy from good music shops and from um, violin makers and also from amazon and it's just called violin polish or varnish cleaner for musical, for um, for string instruments, for for violins, um, and that way it dissolves the varnish, and you have to really rub it, and then polish it, and the varnish will come off. Now, other than that, I don't do anything to my bow, and you can see, perhaps that here, um, it gets a little bit dirty. Now, I have read, I've never tried this that you can wash it into fairy liquid, and I would definitely recommend against that so do not wash it in fairy liquid um, because if that gets too dirty here i think it is time for some new hair on your bow now this bow when was this rehaired about a year ago i think now i play all day every day so that is not too much is it mm -hmm. so don't worry about this bit it's just maybe some grease that comes from your hand like that uh, rosin over it and that will make it less as well but by no, by all means please do not wash it um <clears throat> please also try and avoid taking your bow apart you can take it apart but it's not for amateurs to do that okay um so all you need to do is wipe the stick and put new rosin on and then once a year or once every year and a half get some new hair on your bow, uh, and you'll notice a difference. And you, you know when, to, to, when you have to change the hair on your bow, uh, when the rosin no longer holds, or you find that you need to rosin much more suddenly than you used to do uh, before you need to apply rosin again, because the hair then doesn't hold the rosin. If you look at a hair under a microscope, and you may have seen this sometimes at hairdressers, you can see the hair and it has all these little wispy bits on the side. And that those things hold the rosin, those little wispy bits on the side. Now, if you play a lot, uh, those things disappear. You, that's just wear and tear of the hair. Um, and it will no longer hold the rosin. So this is how you can, how you can tell when you need new rosin on your bow. And that's all as far as maintenance of the bow is concerned. Then there is another question. <clears throat> okay, someone from the USA, welcome. It's lovely to see all these different nationalities here. What chin guard do you use? I find the side chin guard uncomfortable. Yes, what chin rest you use or chin guard you use is very much a personal preference. <clears throat> I, mine is, can you see, over the tailpiece, and it's got quite a stiff ridge. Now, that is because I can hook it under my jaw. Other people find that very, very uncomfortable, and depends on the size of your jaw and the, the length of your neck as well, depending on how high this is. Some people have huge necks, and their chin rest is a lot higher. Some people have got less 
of a of a, a long neck and then you might even get away with having no shoulder rest at all, uh, chin rest at all. So you don't have to have one. If you find it super uncomfortable, why not play without one? Um, I tend to maybe grip it with my jaw a little bit like that, and that's why I like the ridge. Uh, but by all means, play around with some different shapes of chin rests. You can buy them for a fiver on Amazon, say, and um, if you have two or three different ones, you will uh, you will find the one that is suitable for you. You will definitely um, develop a preference for one or the other. Now, the job of your chin rest and your shoulder rest together is to fill up this gap. So some people find it more comfortable to have more of a shoulder rest, so a higher shoulder rest, so it sits higher up and closer to your face and other people like to have their violins further down and then fill up that gap here at the top and that is very much a personal preference um that's all i can say about it so mine is called jiwa and jiwa is a is a german brand gewa it's called in germany and they do very good quality things um and then depending on how high you want it there are different styles of shoulder rest that uh, chin rest sorry that you can screw up and screw down um, and that might suit some people as well so think about the function that you're and the thing that you're trying to achieve is it to fill up this gap now I've got quite a big gap and I like that because it makes my violin flexible and other people might say oh no I don't like that I want to fill up all of this gap and then you might want to start underneath and sort out your shoulder rest first before you sort out the height of your chin rest. I hope that answers your question. Uh, this, here's another good question. Uh, someone says, the best way to learn to keep your bow really perpendicular to the string is to watch yourself in a mirror. Is that correct? Yes, you can do that, but you have to position yourself just right uh, because it's very easy. Let me just see if I can show you this because pretend my screen is my mirror and then you can see what happens. If I stand so that my bridge is at right angles to my screen, which it is right now, can you see that? Then it is fine and you can see it. You see? However, if you stand slightly more angled, you can't see it anymore because you think that is straight. You see? So there is some sort of um, visual distortion here. And the really, truly best way is to ask another person. And you bow like that. And, and you can just say, am I right at right angles? Yes or no? And you can see the much smaller differences. Like if I'm like this, you can't see that I'm slightly angled. But I am, if you look like that. So the answer to your question, is it true you can see it in the mirror, is yes, but you must make sure that your bridge is at right angles to your screen or to your mirror, I should say. I'm hoping that is useful. But like I said, the best way is to ask another person. <clears throat> Oh, here's another good one. And a lot of people will find that very, very useful. Any ideas, is the question, for increasing motivation of practicing the violin more regularly? <laughs> and that, yes, I've got lots of strategies for you. It depends on who it is for. I can clearly remember um, my son, he won't thank me for this. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell him um and not wanting to practice his instrument when he was younger and we just said you get double the amount of screen time to the amount of practice time that you do on your instrument that was very easy and he started practicing straight away because 15 minutes practice meant half an hour's screen time so that was an easy bribery i know also uh, from parents pupils uh, pupils' parents, that they have a little treat for the children ready, sort of on the top ledge in the book on a sh bookshelf somewhere. When you've finished your practice, you may have that, and that is it. Uh, but, of course, what we want to 
try and achieve is to find that intrinsic way that you might want to practice. And that, in my view, only comes from seeing progress through practice. So you might be very firm in uh, the first week or so and say, I'm going to do this every day for a certain amount of time. And then after a week, just evaluate and see, have I made more progress than the week before when I just was free to do whatever I liked? And if you can keep that up for a couple of weeks, you can see very clearly where your progress comes from because the progress comes from practice, doesn't it? Um, and, and that is a much more valuable way of encouraging motivation to practice because you can see how much better you get. Um, what works for one person is not necessarily work, what works for another person. So you'd have to find out what you can start with is to find a specific time in the day when you do your practice. Uh, and you might follow your practice onto something that you always do. So you have dinner and straight after you practice. Or some people find it easier to practice in the morning. Uh, you have breakfast, you clean your teeth, and then you do your practice. And if that becomes a routine, it gets a whole lot easier to manage, you see. You will then have to be quite firm, uh, especially if it is for children and if a parent is practicing with their children, if that is your committed time to practice, don't answer the phone, don't answer the door, just make sure you're there with your child. And a lot of children actually like that a lot. They get a lot out of practicing with their parent. So if this is you being a parent of a child that doesn't want to practice, they do like the company. So if you are with your child when, when the child is meant to practice and they throw a tantrum, you might walk away straight away and say, no, if you're having a tantrum, we're doing this for 15 minutes. If you're having a tantrum in that time, I'm not, I'm not into this. So you walk away. What the child wants the most is your attention and being with you. So that is really a motivator not to throw as many tantrums. Now, that might well take a week or two of very firm handling by the parent that the child starts to see that okay if I get really angry or cross it's not going to work because my parent is going to walk away you see so it's it's finding out the root cause of why you find it so difficult to commit and that's sometimes not easy and like I said different things work for different people um, so you might try one strategy and then try it for like two weeks or so and see what happens and then try a different strategy. It's always easier to find out what works if you change just one thing, isn't it? So don't don't make them practice and then go away and, and have your treat ready and, and do it all at once because you don't know then which method worked the best, you see. I'm hoping that helps. Um, another question here. What is the difference between a professional violinist and an advanced amateur? <laughs> that is a very good question. Let me think about that answer. Um, uh, sometimes there is overlap, definitely. Um, It's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that question. There are some very, very advanced amateurs that could easily earn their living with um, violin playing. They're super, super good and super committed. And that is maybe the slight different aspect of it is that uh, musicians, professional musicians do this for their job. I give myself <laughs> as an example, since this is my job, I won't then after work in the evening play with other people for fun. I used to do that quite a lot, but not now because I tend to keep this very much separate. This is my job and my hobbies are different things. And maybe that is the main, the main um, this distinction between the two because uh, I've seen many very, very advanced ad uh, amateurs who have done equally well as professional violinists. Let me see, what is a good warm up before playing? On some forums groups, they say you do 
you should be doing etudes daily. Um, uh, yes, I tend to do warm up slightly differently because a good etude is some is a piece of music that deals with a certain technical aspect. Um, as a warm up, in my view, you need to warm up your bowing technique and your left hand technique and your position changing and your vibrato and all those aspects, you see. So if I pick out one etude, I'm only warming up one aspect of my playing. So in my opinion, a good warm up um, can be, can be, it doesn't have to be, but it can be playing a scale really slowly and working on your bow hold and then playing that same scale really slowly again working on your vibrato playing that scale really slowly again play it in different positions you see so i go past a lot of different technical aspects uh, of violin playing so that i warm them all up before i start my pieces um i can see what people might say play an etude daily um uh, yeah, it is one way, shall we say. There is actually a very nice book. Um, oh, gosh, what is it called? It's written by Michael Rennie. It's called something like Daily Warm-Up Exercises. And it's you're meant to play that whole book through as you warm up. And it has trills exercises. It's got bowing exercises. So it goes past one of the techniques. Um in each exercise in this book so I think it's three or four pages long and after you've done that for about 40 minutes you're completely warmed up so uh, again that deals with all the different aspects of the violin technique and if you follow my um, virtual violin practice play along course that I'm suddenly uh, that I'm releasing at this stage you can see how it's split up in little sections of all the different techniques and that is my preferred way of warming up I'm just looking at my um, chats again. The pinky becomes L-shaped when holding the bow. The pinky becomes L-shaped when holding the bow. Is it okay? Ah, I don't know. I, I assume this is what you mean. Let me just put my violin away. Yes, some people have got, have got the ability to leave this joint straight and then bend this one. And I'm hoping that that is what you mean. I can't do it. Um, so that means that you collapse in your middle joint. If you keep this middle joint still, or sometimes it gets locked as well, and then this bit bends. <laughs> like I said, I can't do it. <laughs> uh, but it happens with some people. Now, there is a little exercise to make the ligaments over this joint a little bit stronger. And I can show you that. And that might, in the long run, give you some progress with that. Because ideally, the answer to your question is no, it shouldn't be L-shaped. It should be round, like this. But there are issues. It's not as easy for some people as it is for me to bend this joint. OK? Um, so the exercise that I would recommend you do is place your pinky on a surface. Now, let me use this notebook as my surface. Remember, we've got these um, on offer for the winners. OK, so place your, place your pinky on a surface like that. Oh, I can't see. And then let's see if I can do it like this. And then very gently with your other hand, squeeze this. And you gradually make this joint a little bit stronger so it may not collapse. But be very, very careful if it starts to hurt, please stop. I am no doctor, so I don't want to hurt you in any way. Can you see? You can practice that on a table, do it with all your joints like that. Press them down one by one. And hopefully that will make that joint a little bit stronger because when we hold the bow, we are looking to have this pinky round, can you see? So not straight in this joint. I'm hoping that answered your, your question. Let me see if there are any more questions. Um, I 
Okay, there is another question, and thank you for this question, Adrian. Um, let me see. My shoulder wrist angle changes when I'm playing, causing my violin to slip. A very common um, thing to occur. So your shoulder wrist change, changes angle and then your violin slips. Now, there are a couple of reasons for when that might happen. The most common reason is that you're gripping way too hard with your neck like that. And you almost squeeze the shoulder wrist out from underneath. You can perhaps see. Let me see if I can manage it. I'm squeezing really hard and it comes away. So what you can do about that, it happens to a lot of people. Uh, what you can do about that is play a note and then practice lifting your head up and then carry on playing your note, lifting your head up, up and down, like that. Okay, so um, that might help that. There's another reason why it might happen is that um, especially with these shoulder rests, you can pull them in and out um, and you can perhaps see at the bottom, if I pull on this leg here, it will make the shoulder rest slightly wider. And that is done because not all violins are standard sizes. Some are slightly bigger than others. Okay, so it might be if it slips, that is just slightly wide. It should be quite, quite tight, but not squeezing the violin in when you play. So you might push it in a little bit so that it is a little bit um, less easy to come away. And the third reason why that might happen is that this rubber is worn and you get that sometimes with the, the shoulder rests that are covered in velvet as well, um, is that they're just really, really slippery because either the rubber is worn or the velvet is just slipping off your shoulder there. And what you can do is either get a new shoulder rest if you've had it for a long time, which is more rigid again, and the, the legs here are a little bit less wobbly. See, there is some give in that. And would you, if you have a velvet shoulder rest or another material than this, like really non-slip non rubber, uh, put a chamois leather around it because that gives you that non-slip effect as well. I'm hoping that answers your question. Um, Okay, this is also a good one. You remember, we were talking about motivation to practice, and someone says, I lost motivation. I was only practicing the same A, B, R, S, M pieces, and it made me bored and hated the pieces. So now I throw in random pieces to learn when I learn it, and then I change it. And that is a, a very, very good point. Thank you, Louisa, uh, for bringing that up. And yeah, this is a very personal opinion about exams. And here in the UK, people like exams very much. Where I grew up, I never took an exam in my life. And that's the other end of the spectrum, isn't it? Many exams and no exams at all. I, I think the truth may be somewhere in the middle. Um, do some exams, but not all the time. Um, because in my view, exams take actually take a lot of learning time away because like you say, it is very repetitive and you have to really perfect your pieces. Now in itself, that can be a very good thing, is aiming for perfection and really not coming off that piece until it's absolutely perfect. So in itself, that is a very good goal to have. Uh, but if you only play exam pieces and you only play those three pieces and nothing else, yes, that is very limiting, isn't it? So good point, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and somebody else says, I have been playing without a chin and a shoulder rest and use a hanky for support. Yes, that is a good point as well. Some people do that. And suddenly uh, when people play on Baroque violins, they've got something uh, underneath just there, a little bit of support. Uh, and that is also, it depends on what kind of pieces you play. And it depends on the length of your neck. You might just do it like that. Uh, and But if you are wanting to play in the super high positions and if you play very fast pieces with lots of position changes, I must say it is a lot easier to have either a shoulder rest or a shoulder rest and a chin rest. But it's definitely a style of playing. 
um, let me just see. We're going to um, <laughs> come to an end very shortly. Let me see what else have we got. Last question. Uh, okay. Perfect. Well, and thank you for all your lovely comments. And uh, you are very, very welcome to have attended this session. It's been lovely to see so many people here. So if you can, um, subscribe to the channel and hit the hit the bell button so that I can notify you whenever a new video is released. As you may already know, I am finishing this um, virtual violin practice play along um, until, I, I'll keep it going until the end of this lockdown, which is currently um, scheduled, all being well, for the 8th of March. Um, ah, thanks, Tommy. Here's somebody else who um, gives me a, a super chat just to say thanks, that's really, really nice, thank you. So this uh, virtual violin practice play along will carry on until at least the 8th of March, and if I get more inspiration, I'll do that. What is next is um, um, a series called Note Reading for Beginners. Lots of people have asked that. Now, from the questions that you have asked, they may be uh, lessons that you're already way beyond, but uh, feel free to, uh, Watch this space and we'll do um, those lessons next. So if you've got any other ideas for videos that I can make, please, please, please let me know. Send me an email at info at Perm Strings or just write it in any comment underneath any video and I'll get to see that. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending this session. It's been my great pleasure and I very much look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.